Welcome to Awake Ones. We are in Marseille. We've arrived. We're actually here for Lorraine's birthday on a very last minute <laughs> little jaunt. Little jaunt. Although actually the intention <laughs> we we've this is a bit of a detour because we're heading to Avignon where we have some very serious past life work that we need to sort out. But we couldn't resist dropping into Marseille just to check it out and uh, we're pretty sure that somewhere in the scheme of things we're going to uncover information here that is relevant to stuff that we're doing as well yeah and it also happens to be really nice weather and we're on the coast and we're going to go for a really nice brunch it's only about 11 o'clock in the morning we've been up since about <laughs> three o'clock we had an yeah. early morning flight so we will be uh, drinking lots of tea today just to tea coffee just to keep and us away. may partake in a little bit of ice cream at some point <laughs> for sure. I heard the name Innocent, Pope Innocent, and then I heard Gregory, so I think it was around 
that time of the probably the early 13th century and 12th century. So we've just arrived at the Palace of the Popes in Avignon, which was the seat of the papacy for many years. There wasn't just a papacy in Rome, there was also a conflicting one in Avignon for many centuries. And I have a major past life uh, experience that I had here in the 1500s, where I was a monk who was working with books. Uh, I think in that lifetime, I pretended that I wasn't very bright and that I couldn't read so that I was able to get access to all of the really top secret, really important documents and scrolls and I was an artist, I was painting, the, it was the calligraphy on the letters and I was very close, the, the abbot of the monastery was, um, was, we were very fond of each other and uh, so he kind of knew that, uh, the, the, I think the head the guy that was in charge of the scriptorium didn't like me at all. But, so I was always getting in trouble because I would kind of sneak out the documents and under my jumper and go off and hide in a corner and read them. But the abbot knew that I was quite bright and that I was really uh, keen to learn, so supported me, but secretly, silently, so we were very close. And I had another friend whose job was to look after the real hidden books. There was a, a secret chamber that the books that were the most uh, important and the most secret were, were stashed. And then in this past life, uh, it was a time when there was a kind of dissolution of the monastery. And the monastery actually got raided. And I remember very distinctly not being being called to um, to a, a big central space and the abbot being very distressed not knowing what to do the soldiers came in and they well, before they came in we knew they were coming so we had taken my friend and we actually locked him into this secret chamber where all the books were which was in the courtyard and we put a, a paving stone over and covered it with dust so that nobody would know that it was there and he was there with the aim of releasing him and the sacred books once they'd gone, except that they didn't actually, they didn't leave any of us alive. They decapitated, they put a sword through the abbot, cut off his head, and we were all then murdered, we all died. And I died knowing that my friend was left behind in this chamber. And many years ago, a very good friend of mine had actually recounted, I found the notes recently, of a lifetime where he had been uh, locked up in a chamber and had been, his mother had been to look after the books. And then I was in a retreat with Stuart Pearce many years ago and met the woman who was the abbot. And she had literally had a spontaneous recall of a past life. And she was standing in the supermarket, she reminded me of, she said, oh my God, I had this past life where I was an abbot. And we had instant recognition in that moment and we were both hysterical because we knew and she was just apologising in the middle of the supermarket for not being able to save us and protect us and I had to forgive her and tell her it wasn't her fault and that she had done everything that she could. So I've been carrying this story, this information and this wondering where on earth that chamber was that this friend was buried and now being in Avignon and actually being in the Pope's Palace it's just very surreal I haven't quite worked out yet where the where the place is and it certainly doesn't feel like it's right here in this space but we are going to just keep exploring and uh, see what we can find. Funnily enough, just talking to Laurie, we've just walked past a sign that says we're going into the old palace courtyard. And my stomach's just done a bit of a double <laughs> flip. A few flip-flops. <laughs> We've just looked down and seen that everywhere there are these covered slabs that obviously pull up, so there are obviously tunnels underneath. Just 
completely confirming what we'd experienced in that lifetime. And then we're getting sealed in. There's another one there, look, there's a different hatch there. It's concreted in. So we've just found the room that belonged to Chamberlain, who was the one that was in charge of the money and all of the particularly important religious mm. artefacts and objects, only to discover that there are eight different chambers that were underneath the floor where all of the, um, all the important bits would have been kept. That's one of the smaller ones. There's various ones around. So this is absolutely amazing. We've covered over with paving stones and then with carpets and lots of them cut over them to so absolute evidence that what we what we remembered and what we experienced in those past lives were changes. I had no idea that they did this in uh, religious houses at all. So mm -hmm. Talk about a hoarding of wealth. They've got hidden chambers. You can see below me, this is the treasury and they had all secret rooms and places to take taxes and hide them from people. I mean, it's just disgusting, the amount of hoarding of wealth when everybody else is suffering and struggling. I've heard of stuff being hidden, right, below floorboards, but not not concealed so not officially like not officially during and not under stone floors not under stone floors not where not where it's built like this where it's deliberately done so that it can and where the church has done it undetectable and where the church has the church has done it to store all of the most that their money and their wealth and all of the most important documents well we know we do know as well now we know that there are vaults under the vatican right where they hide stuff where well, they've got I mean, yeah, but the vaults in the Vatican are <laughs> under the most utmost Magical top protection. security and protection, physically, and energetically, and in every way. It's really symbolic that people have chucked coins down there, I mean. I know, as if they haven't made enough money. I know, them. why are you giving them more money? It's ridiculous. Uh, thus far, I haven't had memory of a past life as such here but when you walk into this papal palace the overwhelming feeling is of outrage and anger is what I'm getting I feel outraged even when we're walking upstairs it was like they took so much from so many people and what for? What to hide it under bloody floorboards? Yeah, like just build, to stash it away. Just stash it away, build more bloody... More pomp. Build more churches on top of ancient sacred temples that were not meant for this purpose, like this purpose of control and hoarding of wealth. And but they weren't even just them taking it from the people, but they were yeah. also taking it from other churches. From other churches, yeah. It's and anybody that was actually not conforming or that wasn't going along with them were either threatened with excommunication or no longer having the, the papal blessing. I mean, it's just basically trying to be above the law, murdering, pillaging. Yep. It's disgusting. And, uh, the idea that they became these money hoarders, the irony of, you know, one of the most famous stories of Jesus is of him turning over the tables of the money lenders yeah. inside the temples, because it wasn't meant to be a monetary and yet, and event. Yeah. It was meant to be about love and protection and safety and community and people. And, and yet, then, here we are. And they did it all in his name, that's the irony of it. Yeah. They do it all in his bloody name. Bloody, excuse me. But it's true, like, it's all false. So, research into what was going on at the time has just led me to find out about Julius II, who was from the de Revere family, and he was actually the Pope at that time, in 1512, and he was known as the Warrior Pope. 
and he was very adamant about actually sort of restoring power to the church and was the Pope that was responsible for giving Henry VIII permission to divorce his first wife and marry Anne Boleyn. And of course, when that didn't work out, Henry was livid and furious and told them that it was a mistake and that it, they shouldn't have issued it. And that was the moment when the schism happened between the church and the, uh, the, the, the monarchy in England. And I had no idea Looking back, even though Henry, that whole period of Henry VIII was always fascinating to me, I never knew which Pope it was. And so it was that exact time, and in the past life, the message that I'd got when the monastery was being attacked was that it was men from Henry VIII who had come. It was his soldiers who had attacked. And it, I wasn't sure at the time, again, my logical brain questioned why on earth would Henry VIII be attacking this monastery. But the fact that he was furious and was breaking away from the church, it now makes complete sense. So more research needs to be done. But we think we may have found the, uh, it's a Carthusian monastery, and we think that that might be the site of where the, the past life happened. So we're going there tomorrow. Avignon is you can just see the church of Saint Pierre or Saint Peter and we just got pulled in there we just basically got called into that church I just knew I had to go in there we've just come out of the papal palace and wandering around this church we find the most blatant blatant evidence of a, a statue of Mary Magdalene with the skull and the rose at her feet heavily pregnant okay. heavily pregnant statue of Mary Magdalene so no disguising it no yeah, no not even an attempt to, to veil it or literally to hide it. our hands underneath holding the belly up just amazing unbelievable really beautiful Viva la France <laughs> so after an amazing day of walking around Avignon we're now treating ourselves to the evening entertainment, which is a kind of like a light and sound show, isn't it, Laurie? Yeah, and they are effectively going to be projecting images onto the Palace of the Popes. And we, it's, we've walked in and it's covered in stars. It looks like the night sky, which is incredibly beautiful. I think galactic going on here. Yeah. Multi-dimensional, cosmic. And in a way, even though we've been kind of complaining a little bit about what happens with the church and the things that are being done, for me the <laughs> one thing about religion is that, yes, it creates community and it's really important for people to come together and to celebrate rites and rituals that honour various different phases in people's lives, whether it's partnerships, whether it's some children being born, whether it's a, a life passing, so those things are very, very important. But actually it's the buildings, it is the, the absolutely incredible architecture that has been created. That is the gift that I think yeah. religion has left all buildings, it doesn't matter what the religion is. There are so many beautiful spaces and to be able to use these spaces in a way that people can really enjoy them and people can really share and come together and, and so whenever there is music or whenever there is any kind of spectacle, it's just so much more magical because it is in this sacred space. In the space that people would have, done, you know, they would have worshipped it and they would have, you know, used prayer, which you can also feel the energy of that in a space. And whether it was directed for the right reason or not, I think our intention here, right now, and everyone's here, is for enjoyment and for joy. And so that feels like a really good space. Love, joy. I'm so taken back to uh, Foix when we were in yeah, Foix and our last kind of pilgrimage to yeah. France and we, we got guided to Foix and we ended up at a jazz festival and the jazz was playing but overhead there were all these shooting stars and it's yeah. reminding me of that. It's like open air, yeah. really gorgeous and it's like a reward for the work that we've done today as well. We've done a lot of clearing today, yeah. a lot of yeah. different levels, a lot of different spaces and so yeah, it does feel like a good, it does feel like a reward. And it's her birthday and today! It's my birthday. <laughs>